Jerusalem the Golden, a city of ancient yearnings. It stands for the triumph of man's spirit and tugs at his soul. Once a city divided, it is again united. The city of David is the capital of modern Israel. For 2,000 years, the prayer of Jews in exile was a fervent hope. Next year, in Jerusalem. And in the city of gold, that prayer has been answered. come to Israel is to be drawn irresistibly to Jerusalem. Through the Damascus Gate you walk into history. One of the two main entrances to the ancient walled section of the city, the Damascus Gate has stood closed for 20 years. Then came the Six Day War in 1967. And now the ancient doors are perpetually open as an invitation to all men. Any guidebook will tell you the fantastic history of Jerusalem. It was here when Abraham came to the promised land. King David made it his capital. Solomon and Herod built temples here. Christ was crucified. The Christians, Arabs, Turks and a host of others have ruled this city. But Jerusalem is not a fossil. It lives and breathes today. And you will understand the city when you learn to read not only its history, its walls and stones and hills, also the faces of its people. There is a special time to see Jerusalem, the Sabbath Eve. In the murmuring stillness of the oncoming day of rest stroll Orthodox Jews, dressed much as their great-great-grandfathers in Eastern Europe. They come to the Western Wall, the holiest of Jewish sites. It's also the Wailing Wall because this is where Jews have come to bewail the loss of their temple. These large blocks are part of the last remnants of the ancient Temple Mount, about 40 feet high and 60 yards long, with grass growing from its cracks and its crevices stuffed with the prayers of the faithful. The sacred site has become the focus of a new and powerful yearning that has swept Israel and the Jewish world. Beginning with the fervor, dedication and sacrifice of the Six-Day War, the wall has come to stand for everything the Jews had once lost. And now, of regain. Groups of Hasidim, pious Orthodox Jews, are on duty each morning to encourage Jewish men to wear the tefillin, the philasitaries. Each morning, except for the Sabbath, the Orthodox Jew wraps the leather straps around arm and forehead. One set of straps is wound seven times around the left arm with a prayer box close to the heart. The second is worn on the head. Thus, symbolically, the Jew binds his strength, his heart, and his mind together in the service of God.
If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. The young and the old, believer and non-believer, at the wall, all are one. The wall has become an open-air synagogue, and as such, there is a separate section for men and one for women. Orthodox custom forbids mixed prayer. The bar mitzvah, the ceremony which confirms a 13-year-old boy as a responsible adult member of the Jewish people. On this occasion, the ceremony is in the style and tradition of Oriental Jewish communities. A feature of the Bar Mitzvah ceremony is the reading of the Torah, the scrolls of the five biblical books of Moses, encased in wood and written on parchment. To end the ceremony, a bar mitzvah prayer at the wall. <laughs> Jerusalem lives in the golden sun of its present and reflects on the glory and tragedy of its past. It's a city eager to weld its history with its future. And so it's a city of workers, digging, excavating, clearing, building. This team of archaeologists is digging at the southern wall of the temple area. So far, 13 different levels of habitation have been uncovered. Fragments of clay vessels bearing Hebrew inscriptions have been found. But the full story of Solomon and Herod, of the priests and the Levites, a story which lies buried under these stones is still waiting to be told. There is enough work on this site alone to keep a whole generation of archaeologists busy while they sieve through the rubbish and dust of centuries. Like many of the important religious sites are in the old city. Formerly in the Jordanian-held sector, the old city today is part of East Jerusalem. No other city, even in the Middle East, is quite like it. It tumbles through narrow lanes and cobbled alleys, meanders across vaulted market streets and around open bazaars. It's a warren of noisy shops, a smell of spices, flies and donkeys and people.
sedate and serene, a golden-domed Islamic shrine. The Dome of the Rock stands on the site of the Jewish temple. It was built in 688 by Caliph Abdul Malik. On this same site, tradition has it that Abraham prepared to sacrifice Isaac. And Islam believes that this is where Muhammad ascended to heaven on his horse Barak. After Mecca and Medina, this is the most sacred place for Muslims. They call it Haram Esh Sharif. The tragic irony of the gulf between the Arab and Jew lies in the historic link which both peoples share in their reverence for Jerusalem. The Israeli administration has taken care not to encroach on the Muslim title to the Temple Mount. Muslims account for 80% of East Jerusalem's population. They first came here in the 7th century. For 500 years the Muslims ruled here. Then intermittently other kingdoms took over until 1517 when the Ottoman Turks conquered Jerusalem and again Muslims ruled. This time for exactly 400 years until 1970. In that year, General Allenby led his British regiment through the Jaffa Gate. Since then, the British, the Jordanians, and now the Israelis, the first indigenous people to administer Jerusalem for centuries. The third world religion which cherishes a special interest in Jerusalem is Christianity. There are scores of Christian centers in Jerusalem, and it's the headquarters for many high-ranking church dignitaries. They include the three patriarchs, the Greek Orthodox, the Latin, and the Armenian Orthodox. On Palm Sunday, an Armenian Orthodox procession winds its way through the old city. During Easter week, pilgrims crowd the streets to take part in centuries-old rituals like the Greek Orthodox pageant, the washing of the feet, a ceremony symbolizing humility and obedience. feature of the Easter ceremonies is the retracing of Christ's last steps on the way to the crucifixion. This is the way of the cross, the Via Dolorosa. Millions of pilgrims have taken this path stopping to pray at each of the 14 stations of the cross. The stations retrace the route followed by Christ from the Roman Praetorium, the Judgment Hall, to Calvary. The last five stations of the cross are inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre at Golgotha, Christendom's most sacred shrine. Once more, Jerusalem displays her irony. This is where Christians believe Christ was buried and resurrected. But this is where Christians find themselves most divided. Six Christian communities share rights to care for this crumbling church. Greek Orthodox, Roman Catholic and Armenian Orthodox as major holders. Copts, Ethiopians and Syrians as minor holders. None of these hold keys to the church. They're vested with a Muslim family to prevent bickering. 
Lines drawn down the middle of floors and pillars divide the areas. Every few feet the church styles and decor changes. Worship varies, traditions vary. Only faith, it would seem, is shared. A few miles from Jerusalem, the birthplace of Christ at Bethlehem. At the end of a narrow staircase, the traditional grotto of the birth in the Church of the Nativity. The Emperor Constantine built it for his mother. Here, as in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the care and preservation of the church is shared between denominations, the Armenian, Greek and Franciscan priests. And to look out across that landscape from the Mount of Olives is to begin to understand an old Jewish saying. Ten parts of beauty were allotted the world, and of these, Jerusalem assumed nine measures, and the rest of the world but one. Ten parts of suffering were visited upon the world, one for the world, and nine for Jerusalem. After the Wailing Wall in the Old City, the next most important Jewish shrine is on Mount Zion in West Jerusalem. This is the traditional burial place of King David, who ruled over Israel and sang unto the Lord. In a room cut out of rock, the smoke from flickering candles stains the walls and casts shadows over the stone tomb. David chose Jerusalem as his capital because it did not belong to any one of the twelve tribes. And in the three thousand years which followed, Jews have looked to it as David's city. Mount Zion houses a cluster of buildings. The whole area once bordered no man's land, and Arab legionnaires used to be a favorite subject for tourist photographers. Today, Mount Zion is in the center of Jerusalem. Away from the center of Jerusalem, a modern shrine built to revere the memory of another leader, President John F. Kennedy. Opened in 1966, the concrete memorial is encircled by 51 columns carrying the emblems of the 51 American states. The 60-foot high monument is designed in the shape of half a tree trunk, evoking the president whose life was cut short in its prime. These children were born in a kibbutz made famous by former premier David Ben-Gurion who retired from politics to come and live in his beloved Negev. In his 80s, Ben-Gurion retains his vision and his humor. We asked him, as an old soldier himself, why the Israeli soldier was so good. When I was a soldier, I was young, not old. But next to good, he's their officers. The officers learned that in an army it's not enough to have a good discipline. The soldier must have trust in his commander. And to gain the trust of his soldiers, the commander must be an example for his soldiers in the war. He must go first, that they should follow him. Um, can you tell us what the reason is that the best fighter pilots come from Kibbutzim and the best army officers. Why from Kibbutzim? Because, not only Kibbutzim, from uh, Kibbutzim and Moshevim. Yeah. Because our best people are there. The best people are going to Kibbutz and to Moshev. Mm -hmm. So far, I don't know what is going to happen in the future. Can you tell us, Mr. Ben-Gurion, 
What were your very first thoughts when you reached the Wailing War in the Six-Day War? Well, I, I have been there many times, <laughs> the first year when I came to this country. But the first thing was, now, again, Jerusalem, in the entire Jerusalem, is like in the times of David, King David, in the capital of Israel. Can you tell us, what is your advice to young people today? My advice to young people here, that they should serve as an example to other young people of other nations. In their devotions to peace, and to progress, and to humanity. Uh, what is your own personal formula for peace? Formula for peace, that we should feel that we belong to one human race. You mean peace with our neighbors? Well, I doubt whether they will accept my advice. <laughs> uh, what is your forecast for the desert here? What is going to happen here? The desert here must not remain a desert, just as this place. Where you are sitting, five years ago, there was not a single grass, not a single tree. My friends, they bought all trees and planted them here. This can be done throughout the Negev. Um, you have and it should be done. How many years do you think it will take before the Negev is one big garden? Well, this is impossible to say beforehand. And this depends on many people who come to Israel from built to do countries, from Northern America, Southern America, South of uh, Africa, Western Europe. The more they come, the sooner it will be no, no more does it. Uh, Mr. Ben-Gurion, you have consistently attacked Zionism because most Zionists do not come here and settle. Do you believe that Zionism is dead? No, I did not attack Zionists at all. I merely said I am not a Zionist. I am just a Jew who feels that the life of a Jew and of a human being can be only in this country. Who do you think will be the next Prime Minister? Who would you like to see? Oh, I am not a prophet. And a prophet also there's a mistaken notion about prophets. Prophets didn't know what is going to happen. They only knew if you behave the right way, then it will be all right. You go the wrong way, you will have to suffer. But they didn't know what you were going to do. So I cannot say who is going to be who would you right like to next see prime minister. Well, I think it's better that I shouldn't say it. Uh, what do you think is the most important thing you've done for Israel amongst all the important things you've done for Israel? I didn't do any important thing. I just have done my duty, that's all. It's like many others. All my friends, they, they, have, they have done the same duty. How long are you going to be active in politics? I'm not active in politics now. I gave it up four years ago. <laughs> I thought it's enough. I was 15 years Prime Minister, and that's enough. Will Israel always control Jerusalem? I hope so. Well, it was 3,000 years ago, our capital, and why not? Forever. <laughs> In no other country do people take archaeology as seriously as they do in Israel. Israel's most famous archaeologist is Professor Yigal Yadin. I was attracted to this site because it is mentioned several times in the Bible. Firstly, in connection with Joshua, who is, according to the Bible, destroyed that city and burned it. And then we are told that Solomon rebuilt it. And, uh, in fact, uh, in these uh, four years of digging, we found here 22 uh, cities, one on top of the other. The oldest one go goes back to about 2700 BC, or the latest one, the top one, is about the uh, second or third centuries BC. We did find, in fact, the last Canaanite city, which is our city 13 from the top, which I believe is the city which was destroyed by Joshua. We found the city which Solomon rebuilt, which is our city number 10 from the top, 
and from that point of view, of course, it was very important because uh, we could we were in a position to date every stratum really accurately with the help of the Bible and the help of uh, some other external uh, material. I would say, literally speaking, we could have hold the Bible in one hand and the spade in the other. The site which made Professor Yardin a household word in Israel was Masada, the ancient Jewish fortress. Working with a team of volunteers, Professor Yardin revealed the story of courage, which is Masada. The Masada excavation was the biggest archaeological enterprise ever undertaken in Israel. It was not just a matter of historical curiosity which attracted so much interest. It was the story of heroism and sacrifice behind Masada's last stand which drew the volunteers and now draws the visitors. The climb to Masada has become a national tradition. On this great rock in the year 70 flared the last revolt of an independent Jewish nation before its destruction and dispersal by the Romans. These are the remains of King Herod's palace. Some 75 years after Herod's death, the last band of Jewish rebels fled to this fortress after the Romans had conquered Jerusalem. For three years they held out until the Romans finally attacked the walls with torch throwers. The revolt was over, but there was to be no surrender. The leader of the rebels persuaded the 960 men, women and children with him that a death of glory was preferable to a life of infamy. And so after the choosing of lots to see who would wield the sword, there was a solemn mass suicide. The Romans entered the fortress to find only the silent dead. There is a saying in Israel today, Masada will not fall for a second time. The Yad Vashem memorial dedicated to the six million Jews murdered by the Nazis. On the road to Jerusalem, the rusted armoured cars have been left as a new kind of memorial. To the men and women who fought and sacrificed to keep open the road to Jerusalem during the War of Independence.
day, Israel celebrates its rebirth and its victory. The display of Israel's military strength through the streets of Jerusalem is not merely a show of self-confidence and national pride. It is a way of telling the world that the Jew is tired of being the victim. Israel wants peace, but not the peace of the dead. After centuries of persecution, pillage and plunder, after a genocidal attack which wiped out a third of the world's Jews, after homelessness and prejudice, Israel is definite. There will be no more final solutions. The word most used to describe Israel's survival for 20 years is miracle. After three wars, the ingathering of the exiles and the development of a desert, Israel still has her greatest challenges ahead. Not only to survive, but to create a special kind of nation. Some say it will take another miracle for Israel to get there. The Israelis have other ideas. After all, they've made the miraculous happen.